Welcome to the Planning for Life podcast with certified financial planner professional Russell Jacobs and financial life advisor Carl Coolidge. Carl and Russell will share creative strategies and ideas for overcoming challenges in your personal and financial life. Inevitably, life happens, and we will empower you to reach your destination. Thanks for joining us. Now, on to the show. Good afternoon, Ted. Good afternoon. I'm excited about our podcast today and uh, would like to welcome you to the Jacobs Coolidge and Company Planning for Life podcast. Listeners, today we have a great treat. Uh, We have the founder and CEO of Savannah Bee Company, Ted Dennard. So uh, we're going to begin our podcast today with asking you a question or two about your career. I'm sure I'm curious and our listeners will be curious too about just kind of how you found your way into being the the founder and CEO of Savannah Bee Company. So start start back where you grew up and uh, take us through the journey to where you are now. Okay, thank you, Russell. I'm honored to be here. So I was, yeah, grew up on St. Simons Island, Georgia, and grew up right on the beach, which was Wonderful. I used to go out to the mainland with my father who had some property out there and older gentlemen put some bees there when I was about 13 years old. And I would help this guy, uh, Roy Hightower was his name. He taught me the, about making honey, really. And I was kind of always scared of the bees, yet I loved honey. And I loved that the honey tasted differently. And I, I just was and have been ever since. I'm basically in love with honey for some reason. So when I went to college, I ended up having bees. I went to Swanee, the University of the South, um, and had a a landlord that had a big vineyard and uh, and some bees. And uh, we made wine and honey and mead. And he taught me a lot about uh, the fascinating things that bees do. I mean, there's no end of amazing facts, such as uh, the queen being born a worker bee, but she's fed royal jelly and that turns her into a queen from a worker bee. And she lives 40 times longer. So the worker bees are all kind of, uh, they're female or undeveloped queens, really. And this royal jelly substance that they produce kind of gives her that longevity and uh, things like that was, was really amazing. And that really got me interested in, in the actual bees themselves. And then when I graduated with a degree in philosophy and religion, I wanted to go save the world and I joined the Peace Corps and they sent me to Jamaica and they wanted me to teach beekeeping. So I spent two years on that island teaching beekeeping and I really loved to, the beekeeping aspect. Is That's where I developed that love. I didn't think I ever wanted to do anything with bees to, that involved money. I just knew I always wanted to be around bees, but ended up moving to Savannah, Georgia, and was working four jobs, and I had a loan I was paying off, yet I had these five hives of bees. And at that point, I was really ruining the fact that, A, I had majored in philosophy and religion and didn't have a practical anything to fall back on career-wise and and be really that I just didn't have any idea what I wanted to do in life. And I figured I would have had it figured out then because by that time I was 31 years old and was worried, you know, well, you know, just like, I guess a lot of people, you just don't. Know. Yeah. So did you uh, just like, you weren't married yet, right? No, I was not married. So you came home one day and just decided you would try the bee business or was it more involved in that? Well, it's kind of a joke, but it's true. My dad had always told me to do what you love. Don't do anything for money, son. And which I used to think was great advice because I was traveling the world, having a good time. But then when it came time to actually figure some things out, I was thinking that was terrible advice and that he could, because he was an attorney, he could afford to say that kind of (laughs) stuff. And, and yet those five hives of bees I had in my backyard turned into you know, my career. So the, I started selling some honey to a local store. It was actually Jennifer that I'd grown up with, had a store called Once She Opened a Store, One Fish, Two Fish. And she put some honey in the store that I gave her. And then another store owner wanted to put it in her store. And I sold her the honey. And it just started kind of, I, I wouldn't say snowballing, but it grew slowly over the next few years. Um, and this was a sideline hobby of mine. What year do you think that was? Well, that started out in in 1998 or 1999, I guess. So it was three years of selling just piecemeal, um, but to stores around the country like Dean and DeLuca and 
God, the Oakville Grocery, the cheese shop at Beverly Hills and some places like that that were really nice. And and so I decided to give it a go, give it everything I had for one year to see if it might work. And that was 2002. So were you, how did you find those stores or was it word of mouth or were you like hawking honey out of your trunk or? I was sort of doing all of those things and it was a little bit of all of those, really. I went on a trip to the ones in Napa Valley was word of mouth. The, the two in L.A. Uh, was from me going out there sort of like really with a suitcase and a couple of appointments and visiting a friend. And um, and yeah, but but primarily it was word of mouth. And these were all more high end boutique, low volume. So high end, low volume. But correct. Uh, when, when did it uh kind of evolve into more of the business it is today because having known you for a long time, I know it doesn't, didn't just go from that to where you are now. No, no, I wish it was so easy. No, it's been a long, not two decades, but uh, I mean, since 1999 and basically two decades and of, yeah, at first just peddling everywhere I could then going, um, starting to do trade shows in 2002 and more trade shows and, and these bigger retail shows. And, and so that's the way we have grown our wholesale company. And then, and then in two, 2008, we opened our, our first Savannah B, our own retail store here in Savannah. And then we opened two more in Savannah and one in Charleston over the next two years. And now we have 13 retail stores and, you know, we have an e-commerce site and our wholesale business has grown and it is a lot has helped um, like to work with distributors and we've gotten some broad reach and we've gotten into some, you know, grocery channels that have higher volume. And, you know, I still am kind of doing a, a little bit of everything um, from, you know, it's just all everything's just a little bigger. Well, I think that, uh, you know, some companies are identified with their owner more than others. And, you know, I think uh, Ted, the bee guy or the honey guy is certainly apropos. And uh, do I recall properly that you ended up in one of the Inc. Uh, growth rankings or were on Oprah or something like that? Or Oprah knew about your honey? I forget the exact details. Can you enlighten our listeners? We've had some great press. And I think... Part of that press was we were the first people to kind of elevate the honey world and certainly to attend the trade shows doing it and putting in nice jars with nice labels and and some marketing behind it. And it's very giftable the way that we package it in the, these tall wine bottles. And so we, we've gotten, yeah, Ink Magazine gave us sort of the, you know, one of their, their gift guides and that was a great spread. And we were one of Oprah's favorite things, not on the TV show, but in the magazine, uh, first with our Tupelo honey and then with our Royal jelly body butter. And we were in the, you know, the ink fastest growing companies there for a while. And, okay. um, and we've gotten a lot of great press from Southern living to all. I mean, you, I mean, it's really too numerous to mention. And, We've been lucky that way, but again, we have a we have a story. You know, we're I'm a beekeeper, and we still are beekeepers. A whole lot of us that work here, and um, and we're really closely tied to bees and honey. And, and that I, you know, being a religion philosophy major, maybe it's a rationalization, but uh, you know, I got to feel good about what I'm doing, and I do feel good about what I'm doing as far as supporting the beekeepers and who are really supporting the bees and the bees I feel like are supporting the whole planet. And uh, so I feel like I'm helping that, that, that go around. And that's, that's been really fun too. Well, I just saw the uh, article I was traveling yesterday and uh, I saw an article um, Fairmont hotels was actually talking about bees. And, you know, there was a reference that said, I think uh, bees are responsible for at least a third of the food supply that we eat and maybe more than that you would know but uh i th I think people vastly underestimate the importance of bees absolutely i did a, a a ted talk two years ago and i that's basically was the summation was that bees have been here a much much longer time than humans 
And if we want to be sustainable, we should look to them and that, that their mutually beneficial way of living in the world where, you know, when they go to a flower to take what they need to live, which is just the nectar and the pollen, then that flower is benefited. So it's, it's almost like in business, kind of like a strategic partnership, perhaps. But but through that, they have been able to survive, you know, all kinds of cataclysms, I guess, and and rebound and. Um, but, and through that, they have sort of connected themselves to the plant world in a way that we, if we unravel, it's going to be bad, you know? Um, so I think there's two things. One, if we like to eat, then we better keep the bees alive. And two, if we, you know, want to survive as a species, then we're going to want to make daggum sure that we kind of live a little bit more in harmony, I guess is one way of putting it. I mean, I don't think you have to go too crazy, but I don't think it's um, too hard to understand that if you're, if you're not kind of helping, if it's not a win-win situation, it's a losing bargain. And anybody out there in business can understand, you know, that, that kind of relationship only lasts for so long. Absolutely. If it's not a win-win, if it's a win-lose, I think that's, I mean, there's correlations between the bees and the and the business world has got to be win-win, you know, not to digress too far into the weeds, but, well, one of my questions for you is going to be what drives you, but I think we know that now it's the, it's the love of bees and honey and, and sustainability. So, uh, and then I was going to follow that with what has changed, but has anything changed about that or is the driver, uh, talk about what's driving you now? Is it still that love of honey? I know you have kids now you're married. Uh, what would you say to that question? I, yeah, with the kids and, uh, and, uh, my marriage, I definitely am trying to make the company make, you know, money so that we can send everybody to school. Um, so there, there's, that's a little more, um, bold or underscored that need, but, but yeah, no, the, the true driving part is, is more the, the heart of it. One, I won't, it's sort of like your child in a way. So, I want the business to be successful and, and success, of course, you got to have success financially. But to me, if it's only that, that's a little bit empty. And I'm somebody that wants a full, rich life and, and the same for my business. And so I feel like, you know, I want a legacy that where the world is a little, little bit better. I'm not under any delusion, but... I want the world to be a little bit better for us having been here in this company. And so the larger it gets, the bigger the impact. Um, one example is we have just put bees a few years ago on an island down in the Bahamas that did not have any honeybees, got them trained and repopulated the island with a few beehives. And those. And it has grown from the 12 hives we took down there to now a hundred and something is that and then to see the beekeepers and them the happiness and their fulfillment and you know they have a livelihood it's just um, things like that are just great I mean yeah very heartwarming and that that reminds me uh, talk about your uh, bees in school I know it's not called that but you have uh, some sort of uh... yeah we have a not for profit called the Bee Calls Project that we started in 2013 and that you know was right around that colony collapse time when it was getting super, you know reported about. And so we wanted to take the long term kind of view on saving the bees. And so to do that, we want to raise a generation that understand and then will love and protect the honeybees. So we put these glass educational beehives in schools and started off a little slow. And there's lots of stories that we don't have time for. But now we have almost 500 schools across all 50 states that have one of these glass hives inside the classroom the bees come and go through a tube in the wall and so we're well on our way to our initial goal of a thousand schools wow and so it's gotten bigger than i really um expected so, certainly sooner than i expected well that's a great thing and i mean i tell you you know now that uh, my wife Cindy and i you know we have a little bit of land with our house and we have two hives ourselves which is you know somewhat attributable to you in my time uh, spending time at Savannah Bee, and uh, they are fascinating. All right, so let's uh, focus on what's next here. Um, you know, I think the business itself and children keeps you focused. So uh, what are the best life and career decisions you've made, and how did you come about making them? 
I'd say if if I kind of want to combine those two into one, which um, it would be that initial, like my dad's what seemed to be foolhardy advice is follow what you love. And, and it's turned out great for me. And so, it, and it were, there was a lot of uncertainty and, and certainly if, if I had asked and I often did ask and people were like, man, no, that'll never work. But, you know, it's just, I, I loved it. And, and that certain, that gave me that tenacity and perseverance to kind of stick with something that, to make it happen. So, yeah, I think just having the, I don't know if you want to say courage or tenacity or just, it could be just dumb luck, but to stick with something like this so that it could kind of, you know, bear fruit and come to fruition the way that, that it has so far is, is, um, has been great. Like I can't even so maybe, uh, chase your dream, be, be willing to chase your dream for something you love. Don't just settle for a job you don't really like or love. And then the tenacity certainly is key. Don't give up. Right. And, and there's, you know, in business, there's, 10 good reasons to quit every day. And so if you didn't work, if you were doing something you didn't love doing, my God, what a miserable, I mean, that would be a tough job. So no, I think you gotta, you gotta have some deep interest and hopefully a passion for whatever it is. Um, So I feel very, very lucky in in that regard. Well, I think that uh, I I got the uh, good fortune to, get to know Alan Paulson who founded uh, Grumman, which became Gulfstream. And I remember him telling me uh, he never met a lazy, lucky person that you make your own luck. And I think you uh, exhibit that. All right. So let me ask you another question. You know, they say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. What What was your uh, biggest mistake in now 20 years of business and how have you learned from that? Well, there's, <laughs> I mean, where to begin? I'm sure there's several after 20 years having been in business for over 30 years myself. So I understand. Yeah, they're, they're manifold uh, mistakes, big ones too. Um, I, but I can, I can, I can group a number of them into one category and that would be putting too much faith in outside expertise, which, you know, especially coming from my background, which had nothing to do with business. I just figured everybody, somebody else must know what's best, right? So I hired a CEO, which which they helped me greatly in the beginning, but then that didn't really work anymore. I, I've i hired two other people that had a lot of background, a lot of experience, and they could have done an amazing job. In business, you mean they had a lot of business background? Yeah, they had a lot of business background, but honestly, that's that, that those two people almost put me out of business. Um, mainly just from overspending. Um, and that came from their having worked at a much more corporate type, bigger organization. And when you're a smaller business, you know, you have to be scrappy. And yeah, we had had some major cash flow years. Spending too much money opening stores specifically is one. And then going into um, a giant, well, into Target, really. Um into that store with massive sales, which led to massive inventory buildup. And then when the sales weren't there, we were so heavy with inventory that was then dead. Um, it just, yeah, that was hard to dig out of. So you've had the uh, business owners' uh, life lessons the hard way and proven the point of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Have you through this, have you learned to trust your own judgment? Because technically I would say after 20 years of surviving and growing your business that you have a business education now. I absolutely believe that. I think the bottom line, the, the basic business principles, maybe they don't work for the you know, Silicon Valley companies, but I'm, I'd say for the 99% of the businesses out there, it's real simple. Um, and it's just kind of A minus B, like your sales minus expense <laughs> equals your cash. And it's, um, it, you have to, you don't overcomplicate it, break it down into simple and keep an eye on those, those metrics. And so you don't ever want to run out of cash. And then you want to balance that investment in growth and future, um, you know, just go just far and out enough out on that limb without going too far, um, where you, you risk losing it all. You know, that's the, that's the job of the business owner or CEO or whatever you want to call it to. Yeah. The buck stops with you. Yeah. You know, you don't want to be too conservative, but you don't want to be too aggressive and to know where, where that line is, is, uh, 
it's like walking a tightrope. Well, it's really trial and error to a degree. You know, it's not like you're talking about tech. It's not like there's an algorithm for what you do. And, you know, you have to educate people about honey so they can True. appreciate it too. Um, and it does seem that a lot of your team members, they get it because, you know, there's some, there's synergy there, it seems, with a lot of the people that work on your team, uh, having had the opportunity to meet them. And that's important as well. Um, well, let me ask you uh, this, as far as it, it relates to uh, looking at your business down the road, um, how old are your kids? My sons are 11 and 12, and my daughters are 19 and 21. Okay. So uh, I guess uh, the sons are a little younger, but between the four of them, uh, is there, uh, do you think, a, a second generation of Savannah beekeepers uh, in the family, or have you thought about who's next? After Ted? I do think about that. I go back and forth. The girls, I, you know, I don't know. It's still a little early, I think, to tell. And I don't blame them because I just certainly didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, they're certainly capable. Um, but I don't know. I don't expect them to take it over. The boys, one of them says that's going to be his fallback. <laughs> and so, I, but in my, so what do I think? I think that I'm going to, run the business, make the best decisions I can for the business. If I get the business to a place where I think if, as long as I can stay at the helm running the company um, and the company is doing what I think it can do, which is really grow and continue to expand, hopefully around the world, then there's no reason to bring in somebody from the outside. Would you still love what you do the same way you did to start? Would you say? I do. I do. And it's different, but I, but I do, I it's still really creative. I think there's 170, 80 people that work for Savannah B company now. And, you know, it's fun and I'm proud of being able to provide, you know, not just a job, but it's kind of like a meaningful job. There's a lot of people that are here for the, the heart and the paycheck. Yeah. That's important. You know, I think that's missing in this, uh, in the corporate uh, world and, you know, the whole sustainability and business, the fact that you can combine that. Um, and I think you are lucky to be able to do something that you love and it became your business and is still your passion. So that's great. Many people don't get that opportunity. They settle. So I guess, well, uh, as we begin to, to wrap up, let me ask you a, a couple other questions. One, what is the biggest piece of advice you'd give to uh, other entrepreneurs or business owners? Well, the first, I mean, the one I probably say the most is what I've already said about you. I hope you have, you know, do what you have a passion for is the number one. <laughs> and then number two, I've already said it is it was taught to me early on and improved over and over and over. And the, the basic business fundamentals are always going to be the basic business fundamentals. And you keep an eye on those things um, and you don't give it up to somebody else without, you know, a little bit of oversight on your part. So. Don't let them spend money on your behalf if it's if it's not theirs. They don't. I don't know. They don't seem to. It didn't work well without you being directly involved. I guess. Right. Well, I mean, you know, I so far I like what I'm doing. I'm going to the Bahamas in two weeks to teach um, a six day course across three different islands, all on beekeeping, and and the, the it's the government of the Bahamas that's paying for this one, which is awesome. I mean, they're not paying me; they're paying. <laughs> For my flight, they're covering the call. lodging. Well, let me ask you. That's a segue. That had, what's the funnest thing that you might recall in your twenty years uh, that you've gotten to do because you're Ted, the Savannah Bee guy. Uh, oh, wow, that is that's um that's a great one. Well, there's a I'd say you know going and putting the bees in in that on Exuma in the in the Bahamas, um, repopulating that island that had no bees. That was a huge, great, fun thing um, and has led to so much good stuff. Um, and then something that was just really fun for me was there's an old story that Zeus was, um, you know, his dad was Kronos and ate all the children. Um, but he was he was hidden and, and the Kronos was fed a rock. So he was hidden in a cave in Crete is where they say. And I was in Greece and went to Crete and then I went to Zeus's cave where he was supposedly weaned on milk and honey. 
he used to cry. And so the, the guards outside the Melissa, the women outside the cave would bang their swords on the, on the shields to, so that Kronos wouldn't hear their baby crying. And when you do that, you, it's called tinning in the bee world and it makes swarms of bees come and land. They, they, instead of flying, they just light on the closest thing. So there were supposedly all these beehives hanging on the caves. And, um, and I took a little three ounce bottle of Tupelo honey and I shouldn't tell anybody this, but I hucked it up in this little alcove where in another 5,000 years, somebody will probably be excavating and wondering like how that Savannah bee Tupelo honey got, put in that cave that's a neat story so honey's taking you all over the world and uh you've been able to chase your dream yeah so i guess the last question i'd ask you as we just wrap up was leaving it up to you if you had any parting words of wisdom or something that maybe you'd like to share that i haven't asked you right now i don't know if it's word no it's not words of wisdom but i'd say it's what i'm i'm kind of wrestling with is trying to figure out what that life I'm 53 years old now. I don't want to always do the same thing every day. It's not that I don't want to be in the company or work. Um, it's just I don't want to be standing at a computer or, you know, I want to get out more and do more stuff that that really only I could do for the company, but also for me. Um, and just trying to find that balance of is, is hard. So I'm just I'm trying to assemble a great team. And again, I don't have it figured out, but I think if you can make sure that you take time, make time there is, and there's no time, there's never time, make some time for yourself, whether that's just self pursuit of whatever, you know, what less I like to surf, you know, so if it were just me wanting to do something for me, it'd be do a lot more surfing around the world. But even if it's part of the business to make sure that you make it happen. So you work on it. We call that working on it, not in it, because you can always get sucked into the, the day to day, a spinning wheel, but you're saying take time for yourself too, so you can recharge your battery and your creative juices. Absolutely. And there's, you know, don't underestimate like living life a little right to its fullest because, um, you know, because you can and you should, and, and you never know how long you're, you're going to have. And you'll, yeah. the last thing you're going to regret is having lived some, great times in life um, outside the office. So so if you listen to this podcast, share it with your friends, share it on your Facebook, Instagram. Let's get the word out about Jacobs Coolidge and Company, but more importantly today, Savannah B Company, because it's a great story and a great product. Ted, thank you for your time. Hey, thank you too, Russell. I appreciate you including uh, me and, and the company. All right. Have a great day. All right, you too. The content is developed from sources believed to be providing accurate information. The information in this material is not intended as tax or legal advice. Please consult legal or tax professionals for specific information regarding your individual situation. The opinions expressed and material provided are for general information and should not be considered a solicitation for the purchase or sale of any security. Russell C. Jacobs III, Carl B. Coolidge, James Jacobs, and William Schwartz are registered representatives of and offer securities, investment advisory, and financial planning services through MML Investor Services, LLC, member SIPC, Supervisory Office, Jacksonville, Florida. Jacobs Coolidge & Company, LLC is not a subsidiary or affiliate of MML Investor Services, LLC, or its affiliated companies. 